This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. It's been lovely having you here. Thank you. Uh, in, in case anyone doesn't know, uh, Kimberly uh, Coles has been our uh, SAS visiting fellowship fellow this year. That's a very prestigious uh, 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 offering that we have, and uh, she was appointed from a pretty stiff uh, competition. Uh, having spoken to you during the period that you've been here, I think it's been, from your point of view, uh, mm-hmm. a, a, a good move. You've been able to get quite a lot of writing done. From our point of view, it's been really nice having you around and part of our. Uh, uh, part of our academic community for uh, you know, the six months or so that you've been here. You're just about to go, I think, aren't you? Get one week. One more week to go. So, um, you're going back to Maryland, where you're an associate professor. Um, you're going back with, I hope, more of your book written than you had at the start. And in fact, the, the, the talk tonight comes from your book, which is looking at uh, uh, the uh, constitution of belief in early modern England, and this is a particular uh, component of um, the moral uh, constitution. Um, so we look forward very much to hearing about the tragedy of Marion. We have some quotations, and the uh, floor is yours. Yeah, uh, we're off. Yeah, okay, you're off. Um, I, I think you probably all heard, because it's not a big group, but this is actually a, a substantial bit of this is going into a collection um, and being sent off on Sunday, but there's uh, opportunity for revision. So any um, saving me from public embarrassment would be greatly appreciated. Uh, the title of the paper, paper is Moral Constitution, Elizabeth Carey's Tragedy of Merriam and the Color of Blood. Any feminist inquiry must assume that the gravity of political power bears upon the sex subject, irrespective of other considerations of subject position. Years ago, Dibna Callahan wrote brilliantly and provocatively about how Elizabeth Carey deploys and manipulates the concept of race as a vital aspect of her construction and interrogation of femininity in her drama The Tragedy of Marion. I revisit this observation because as much as I admire the piece, I believe that a different concept of race needs to be applied to Carey's interrogation than any modern apprehension of the term affords. Recent scholarship has opened the question of the continuities and discontinuities between early modern and modern rationalizations of bodily difference, and Carey's drama usefully throws both into sharp relief. But perhaps more productively, a contemporary, which is to say early modern application of the term, reveals, I think, the extent to which sex is weighted among competing claims on subjectivity explored in the play. In early modern England, the term race commonly referred to family lineage or bloodline and relied on pervasive notions of what were believed to constitute the properties of the blood the humors, the four bodily fluids of yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood were thought to be in equilibrium in noble subjects. The anxieties anatomized in Thomas Eliot's book named The Governor about the degradation of race or the corruption of noble blood described the physical technologies by which virtue, both physical and moral, was thought to convey through bloodlines. If Carrie's Marion is about anything, it is about rank, and the privileges and moral courage and superiority that rank inherently bestows. Marion's whiteness against the colored background of Salome and Herod does constitute the moral encoding of race and subjects, but the race in question is a difference in rank. By reading these binaries of white and black as Christian semiotics mapped onto tribal differences, We miss two components of Carrie's interrogation that are most revealing of her representation of early modern subjectivity. First, that she posits a moral constitution, moral differences that are literally a feature of the blood or humoral disposition and that are revealed in the external complexion of her characters. Second, that rank or race is a more essential constituent of human being 
than is either sex or sexual identity and identification. The attitudes reflected in the play may well be altered by 1626 when Carrie's confrontation with her husband makes her political and economic power, or the absence of it, painfully evident. But this is circa 1605. Callahan's analysis has already engaged questions of social hierarchy. She does not overlook the fact that the power relations of the play are a function of rank. Rather, she perceives the differences in power and morality presented in the drama as determined not only by gender, but also by race and class. Her critique recognizes that the transgressive natures of Herod and Salome have their origins in inferior heritage, but the heritage upon which she most often focuses is that of nation and not of family relation. I want to refocus attention on race in the play as that of family work line or rank because of what it reveals about contemporary medical philosophy and the color of blood. The concept of race is still under construction and our understanding of the term inevitably profits through an engagement with its long evolving history. Carrie's Marion reads subjectivity from the inside out. Interior moral and physiological characteristics are marked on the skin. An exterior complexion, red as a set of interior moral characteristics, is not a construction that's new to race. But how this gets applied to the race of ruling families exposes assumptions grounded in contemporary medical theory of moral composition and constitution as an inherited trait. In light of recent research that suggests that the concept of race descends from animal husbandry and discourses about races of dogs, pedigrees, and selection methods, we need to revisit questions concerning noble blood. As Charles de Maman writes, this transformation of heredity is not limited to hounds, but the revival of hereditary blood early in the 14th century is an example of the cultural and political evolutions that explain the birth of race. Eliot and other early modern political and medical theorists suggest ways that this conception of hereditary blood gets applied to human subjects. So too just carries the tragedy of Marion. In the book named The Governor, Eliot demonstrates the extent to which bloodlines and blood relations determine the physiological and moral temperament of human subjects. His instruction on the rearing of infant children of English nobles concentrates upon the careful maintenance of their inherited moral constitution. Eliot pays particular attention to the choice of a wet nurse advising that the selection for noble ch children must be dictated by her complexion or the distribution of the humors expressed in her milk. He con his concerns about the humoral complexion of the nurse demonstrate the extent to which blood was believed to direct the character. He says that the nurse should be in no servile condition or vice notable, for as some ancient writers do suppose Oftentimes, the child soaked the vice of his nurse with the milk of her pap. <coughs> her complexion must be of the right and pure sanguine. Since a nurse of noble rank was usually out of the question, Eliot tries to safeguard against the contamination of noble blood through its mingling with the blood of the servant, since breast milk was understood as blood, as understood as blood in another form. The nurse, therefore, must not be servile or of very low status, must be of a young and healthy age, and must demonstrate a strong moral character, the grounding of which was thought to be the quality of her blood. While Eliot's fixation upon blood as the source of moral corruption might appear strange to us, his advice ultimate, is ultimately de derived from an inherited set of psychological assumptions. This advice has classical origins, but it is a commonplace within 16th and 17th century Galenic medical philosophy. 
Elliot explains the susceptibility of noble children to their wet nurse in the following way. And this is the first quote on your handout. The brains and hearts of children, which be members spiritual, whilst they be tender, and the little slips of reason beginning in them to virgin, there may hap by evil custom some vice to pierce the said members and infect the corrupt and soft, and infect and corrupt the soft and tender buds whereby the fruit may grow wild. Eliot situates the mind among the higher faculties of the rational soul as one of the members spiritual. This would seem to put it out of reach of the body's operations, thereby rendering it invulnerable to the quality of milk that the wet nurse dispenses or other impressions from her weakness of character. And yet, virtually every medical treatise of the 16th century grappled with the proximity of body to soul, and to what extent the body could affect the soul and vice versa. Thomas Wright claims that it is the work of natural philosophers to explicate the manner how an operation of the mind that logic in the soul can alter the body and move the humors from one place to another. The body has a reciprocal ability to affect or infect the soul. As Levinus Lemnius explains, the soul's concretion with the body occurs in conception when it mixes with the parent's seed, which is of the purest and best concocted blood. Lemnius delivers a fairly straightforward Aristotelian brief in which the soul is united and spread throughout the body as its substantial form, endowing the rest of the members of the body with its powers and giving such shape and proportion to the things animated as daily we see represented and set before our eyes. The soul directs and governs the mind and understanding, but these faculties, insofar as they inhabit the body, are subject to its corruption. Lemnius's whole treatise concerns the complexion or humoral disposition of the body in order to maintain both mind and body in health. Indeed, in his description of a soul taking a body, Lemnius makes clear that it is the mixture of parents' blood from which humoral complexion is initially composed. But while superior humoral disposition is thought to descend through bloodlines, it was left to the individual to maintain the quality of his or her constitution. This moral physiological obligation compelled the analysis of the vices and virtues attached to various complexions that filled folios of contemporary medical tracts. Lemnius proceeds to deliver such a moral exposition of bodily temperament in subsequent pages, so that every man may perfectly know the nature and condition of this complexion and constitution as well as the potential hazards of its degeneration, Lemnius provides the marks and tokens of humoral disposition in color coding. Which constitutions make the color of face and body fair or foul, good or bad? The humors are a product of digestion, but these concoctions of the body are vulnerable to internal and external conditions, diet and climate, and even psychic and emotional states. The ingredients of such a complicated mixture makes the brew of noble blood susceptible to the impression of immediate environment. The fact that affected humors also disturb the operation of the rational mind, and consequently the soul, renders the moral constitution of human subjects pliant to outside forces. Eliot's preoccupation with noble blood not only demonstrates its perceived vulnerability, but also its value in relation to the blood of others. The assumption regarding the superiority of noble blood and the physical, intellectual, and moral supremacy that attended it offered stability to the social hierarchy that it naturalized. Hence, Eliot perceives, in the, the, perceives the utter destruction of the realm in the wrong selection of a nurse. Race, yes, not, not dramatical. Race is a vexed term, but similar to other forms of racial logic subsequent to it, 
The race and family lineage in the early modern period buttressed a political arrangement with the fantasy of the body. Similarly, too, the blood of lineage bore a signature of color expressed in the face. Shakespeare plays upon these contemporary app apprehensions of race in 2 Henry IV, when Prince Henry declares, by God, before God, I am exceeding weary. And Poyne says, it's come to that. I thought weariness durst not have attached one so of so high blood. Henry, faith, it does me though it discolors the complexion of my greatness to acknowledge it. Of course, Henry simply means that it discredits his rank to admit that he is physiologically, humorally, as weak as other men. But his terms are no accident. Eliot maintains in the Castle of Health that those possessed of equality of humors are visibly marked by red and white skin whereas those with an inequality of humors have skin that is black, sallow, or white only. Complexion, in Henry's phrasing, refers to both humoral constitution of an individual and the external hue that is a sign of the inner disposition. He's therefore suggesting that his admission sullies his noble status, but he's also punning on the visible marker of his noble blood, the color of his skin. Race can refer to either rank or nation in the early modern period. So the distinction I'm making between concepts and how they're pressed into service in the play requires a careful separation of terms and ideas. <coughs> the first confrontation of the drama between Marion and Salome, Herod's sister, presents such an opportunity, and this is also on your sheet. Marion says, my birth, thy birth, thy baser birth so far excelled. I had to both you and Herod the princess been, thou party Jew and party Adamite, thou mongrel issued from rejected race. And Salome responds, still twitch you, me, with nothing but my birth. What odds betwixt your ancestors and mine? Both born of Abraham, both were made of earth, and both did come from holy Abraham's line. Mariam appears to be drawing lines of separation based on tribal inheritance, particularly slurs such as mongrel issued from rejected race. But I will insist that the race she intends here is a rejected family line. As Salome points out, she and Mariam ultimately share an ancestry. Asaph, the supposed progenitor of the Edomans or the Edomites, sold his birthright as the elder of two sons to his younger brother Jacob for pottage. On first feeling her twins fighting inside her, Rebecca is told by God that two nations are in thy womb, and two men or people shall be separated from thy bowels. This pronouncement supports tribal divisions as the principal category of distinction. But the Lord further declares, the elder shall serve the younger. The Hasmonean dynasty from which Miriam descends had ruled Judea for over a hundred years before yielding to the Herodian dynasty in 37 BCE. But the Idumeans had already been incorporated into the Jewish nation for 88 years, nearly the full term of Hasmonean rule. The displacement of Hasmoneans was facilitated by the machinations of Herod's father, Antipater, but was secured by Herod and his marriage to Marian which is to say that the struggle represented in the play was an, eternal, an internal one for rule of Judea, not an external one of tribal conquest. Herod's assassination of Mariam's remaining male relatives was a political and not a tribal gesture. Its motivation was the elimination of political competition, not any kind of ethnic rivalry. In Thomas Lodge's translation of Josephus's Antiquity of the Jews, the source for Carey's play, race is used to denote nation only once in the history that traces Herod's rise to power. And this spans 85 pages, so it's a significant portion of the narrative. In the list of the contents to Book 14, Josephus includes a heading of the race of Antipater and how he purchased renown, great power, and authority, both to himself and his children. 
The subsequent introduction of Antipater indicates that race here refers to nation. He's described as a certain friend of Hyrcanus, by nation an Idumean, and by name Antipater. This is the single instance in the account where the term race appears to invoke Antipater's place of origin and not his ignoble birth. The term is often used throughout the history, but on all other occasions, in particular reference to the story of Herod, it refers to lineage and family line. Further, the next sentence illuminates the real problem concerning Antipater's Idumean ancestry. Nicholas Damas Damascene, writing of Antipater, that he was descended from the noblest among the Jews who returned from out of Babylon in Jewry. But this he did of set purpose to gratify Herod, Antipater's son, who afterwards became king of the Jews. Herod compels the rewriting of family history to achieve a nobler heritage where he descends from among the ancient families of Jews taken into Babylonian captivity. This revised account serves two purposes, elevating Herod's status and legitimizing his religious affiliation. Antipater's origins complicated Herod's rule because his descent from Idumeans rendered him of the common sort. Further, since Idumeans had been compelled to convert under John Hyrcanus, the great-great-grandfather of Hyrcanus, Marius, um, grandfather, and forced conversion was not recognized. The religious commitment of Herod's father was suspect. Herod's family, excuse me, was suspect. In Josephus' narrative, the Hasmonean dynasty is largely overthrown by themselves in their own infighting. But the principal objection to Herodian rule is their mean descent and questionable religion. As Josephus puts it, thus, Hyrcanus and Aristobulus, his brother, through their dissension and civil broils, were the cause of that servitude that fell upon the Jews. For the Jews have lost their liberty and have been subdued by the Romans. And the royalty, which before time was an honor reserved for those that were of the race of high priests, have been bestowed on men of obscurity and communion. And this is on their sheet as well. None of my observations differ from previous assessments that the use of complexion to accentuate status, cultural, and religious differences is quite striking in Mary. And that is from Kim Hall in Things of Darkness. All that is different in my analysis is the shift from exterior to interior complexion. But this makes a difference in terms of understanding how moral authority and reprobation is understood in the play. Josephus consistently emphasizes Miriam's rank, not her tribal affiliation, and by contrast, that of Herod and his kin. Indeed, Josephus attributes Salome's hostility to the tendency of Miriam to taunt her for the mean quality of her birth. Carrie's drama conflates two episodes where Herod travels abroad in order to maintain his political alliance with Mark Antony. Upon his return from the first trip, Salome implies that her husband, Joseph, with whom Herod has committed the government, both of the kingdom and his private estate, ha has been too familiar with Marion. Josephus makes the policy of Salome clear. Um, but emphasizes that her hatred is directed more to Marion than her husband. She spake through the malice she had long time conceived. For that certain debate, Marion had in her rage despitefully hit them in the teeth with their obscure birth. In the history, it is both Salome and Herod's mother who accuse Marion. And it is implied that Marion denigrates the birth of the entire family including Herod, just as she does in the play. Indeed, Marion's tendency to upbraid and publicly reproach both the king's mother and sister, and to tell them that they are but abjectly and basely born, is represented as something of a habit in Josephus' narrative. 
marrying a slur of Salome as party Jew and party Edomite in their dramatic encounter is consistent with Carrie's source. But in Josephus, it is a distinction of rank. Salome's mother, Cypris, is descended from a noble Nabataean family, but both are basely born in Mariam's estimation because neither, neither is descended from a noble family among the Jews. Salome is party Jew because of the religious identity of her family is suspect, and party Edomite because even her Edomaean ancestry is partial and divided. That Carey also understands these distinctions in terms of rank and not tribe is suggested by her assertion that Herod desired Mariam in the first place for her high blood. This not only sets Mariam's lineage at a higher premium than that of Herod or Salome, it underscores the difference between them as one of rank. Mariam's insults against Salome ultimately concern the hierarchy of families and not nations. Mariam invokes the politics of the past, Salome those of the present. Both resort to the status of family line to declare their superiority over the other. Carrie is depicting a family drama, the conflict between a ruling family in decline and one in ascension. She shrinks the political conflict to the proportions of the domestic struggle. That women should be at the center of this struggle is entirely appropriate to the genre of a closet drama. But it is also opposite to the nature of the conflict itself, where a term internal strife weeds political rivals. The women of the family are ultimately the members who survive. Hence, the opening scenes of the play pit Alexandra and Mariam against Salome. The Hebrew women are now transformed to men, engaging in a battle of words where men are absent. We should not lose sight of the fact that this is a contest between two families in a shifting political order. The women ultimately seek to have the authority of their family recognized. The care chooses sides in this conflict is also clear. The increasingly white images used to describe Mariam as the play progresses are set against the darker aspect of Salome and Herod. At the conclusion of Mariam's argument with Salome, she says that she will not pollute her breath with the black acts that Salome has committed. Salome is painted black by other characters as well. Her husband tells her that he blushes for her because she's lost the capacity. Even Salome speaks of her tainted brow that obscures blushing. But her darkness is thrown into particular contrast against the superior color of Mariam. Herod is most inclined to the comparison. Salome is so unlike Mariam in her shape that when you to her, have approached near, myself have often tamed you for an ape. You are to her a sunburned blackamoor. He calls Salome his black tormentor. She is outmatched in her sex when placed in contradistinction to the white Marian. And Herod again says, Marian was so fair. Oh, what a hand she had. It was so white, it did the whiteness of the snow impair. While Christian semiotics diagram the moral differences or the construction of moral differences in Carrie's Merriam, we can see how these readings of moral character begin in the blood. The superior quality of blood itself accounts for the superior moral character of the human subjects of the play. Mariam's whiteness is an in the index of her higher rank and her fitness to rule. It marks her as constitutionally, physically, and morally superior. Perhaps the strongest evidence that Carrie ascribes a moral constitution to rank lies in her rewriting of the history of England, not Judea. Carrie opens her history of the life, reign, and death of Edward II, King of England, with this assessment of Edward's moral character. He could not have been so unworthy a son of so noble a father if either virtue or vice had been hereditary. 
But in spite of the conditional clause with which it begins, the history affirms throughout, relentlessly so, that virtue and vice are indeed hereditary. Edward is quickly marked as a mere imposter to the honor of his birthright, and the rest of the history is an anatomy of political corruption. Carey attributes Edward's degenerate nature to having been misled in his unright knowledge by Gaveston, his Ganymede, a man as base in birth as, as in condition. Edward's temperament is obviously affected by his disease of passion for Gaveston, but it is principally the fact that he surrounds himself with people of inferior birth at Gaveston's urging that affects his full alteration. Further, Gaveston advanced beyond proportion or his birth and merit remakes the kingdom in his own image. And Carey says, the sacred rules of justice were subverted, the laws integrity abused, the judge corrupted, or the judge corrupted or enforced, and all types of honor due to virtue, valor, valor, goodness, were like the peddler's pack made wear for Chapman. The history of Edward II reads as a cautionary tale of the hazard of surrendering government to those constitutionally unfit to rule. Edward turns over his government, the government of his kingdom, to sycophants and favorites of base heritage, or in the case of Hugh Dispenser, those who were newly made, until he himself becomes a mere stranger to those abilities that are proper to rule. The king's natural temper is corrupted through these influences, and the whole kingdom mim mimics his degenerate nature. The intemperate and indiscreet government had alienated the hearts of the people. The ulcers festered daily more and more. The outbreaks of internal revolt are categorized as humoral disease, literally distemper, mapped onto the king's body. For it is a very dangerous thing when the head is ill and all the members suffer by his infirmity. Carey's chromatic contrast of Salome and Miriam denotes the social hierarchies that the play itself naturalizes. Alexandra concludes the argument with Salome with the dismissal, let us go. It is no boot to let the head contend against the foot. This declaration forms the central argument of the play. Eliot's contention that the corruption of noble blood risks the utter destruction of the realm is writ large although the corruption lies in the exchange of families. While the principal distinction of the play is made between the king of Jewelry's spare, fa fair and spotless wife and Salome, his sister, whose spots are acknowledged even by her, the differences in the blood of families is identified by the tincture in the skin. Herod and Salome are dark. They are marked as usurpers and not the natural rulers of Judea. Herod is a base enemy, the damned in Esau's heir. Must he, Alexandria asks, heir Jacob's child, Marion, the crown in Herod? Family affiliation is identified by color, and Herod is marked red because he descends from another branch of the family tree. As Alexandra says, his cruel nature with, um, excuse me, his cruel nature, which with blood is fed, that made him me of sire and son deprived, he ever thirsts for blood and blood is red. His excess of color shows in his face, but it's also evident in his rule. He is rash and impressionable, bloody minded and easily led. Herod seems unable to rule, and even less so after he kills Marion, as he complains, she was my graceful moiety, me accursed, to slay my better half and save my worst. What is noble in him, or at least about him, dies with his wife. It is because Marion is the natural ruler of Herod that she's permitted within certain, within certain terms of the play to break codes of female behavior and still retain her moral superiority. 
Salome, by contrast, cannot. Her defiance of her husband's and presumption that she shares in the rights and privileges afforded to men, such as the right of divorce, are chief among the black acts with which she is charged. When she is found in conference with another man, her husband upbraids her. Constabra says, oh, Salome, how much you wrong your name, your race, your country, and your husband most. I blush for you that have your blushing loss. I'm, of course, choosing all the choice quotes that disprove my thesis. Um, so, once again, Salome is dyed in a dark color. Race here does not refer to nation or tribe. It invokes the name of the previous line. And I invite you to sort of re-examine that on the page. As in lineage, nation, and husband. It is also clear from Constabris's subsequent railing against Hebrew women, among whom he counts Salome, that he means the nation of the Jews, and that he is not setting Idumeans apart. Salome is blackened and damned by her own bad actions, but her actions are in many ways identical to those of Herod. This raises the question of to what extent moral incontinence attaches to status and to what extent it fashions, fastens to gender. Constabris is also a man, but he is morally approved in the logic of the play. This is in large measure because his natural position has been seized by Salome. His words to her are intended for her good, to raise her honor and stop disgrace. His subsequent description of a world turned upside down by women ruling men also seems to receive the approbation of the play. But it is Salome alone who should be restricted by this natural order, not Marian. Marian also divorces her husband in that she refuses conjugal relations with him. But she remains unique among women. Women are a wavering crew whom Constabris curses to the end, but Miriam is the one to give women any grace. Even Herod claims that Miriam cannot be darkened because she is by heaven made so bright. Those who rule, whose rule is accepted as natural are brilliant, and those who unnaturally seize power are dark. Clearly, the gravity of political power bears upon Mariam as a sex subject in the play. Her husband executes her. But what precisely is interesting about the tragedy of Mariam is the extent to which this position is ameliorated by other material conditions. The natural hierarchies of the play are color-coded, but this is not, or not only, metaphor. Color marks the humoral equilibrium, the superior physical and moral disposition of the social superiors of the play. The play supplies us with a representation of a political order naturalized by a fantasy of physiological supremacy. And this distinction reorganizes the social relations within it. Marian can assume the rights and privileges of men and retain her moral authority because she is, or so the play would have it, inherently superior to her husband. Indeed, Herod declares that if she had been like an Egyptian black and not so fair, she had been longer lived. His argument is that if she had not passed all women in every gift, in every property, she would not have provoked such an extremity, extremity of feeling. This would have spared both Salome's jealousy and his own. It is clear, however, that in his contrast of black and fair, he's not simply speaking of an exterior quality. Rather, he says that her excellencies in every gift, in every property, wrought her timeless fall. Color functions as an index of moral character in the tragedy of Marian, but as I've been insisting, the marker attaches to status and not to tribe. Now, since race is both, since race as both category and political concept is imbricated, 
It seems unsophisticated to make the distinction between rank and nation at all, particularly when the concept appears as promiscuously involved as it does in Marion. But the manner in which race subjects are encoded in the drama helps us to perceive the black-white binary deployed as something more than recreation in a semiotic field or the evaluation of external hue. For the purposes of social study, it's sometimes necessary to isolate a road within a busy intersection. Understanding race as the constitution of noble subjects reveals how moral rectitude is appreciated in essential terms in the early modern period. The body is literally the original site of moral capacity. To apprehend racial logic in these terms places a particular field of early modern medical knowledge and its application to social arrangements open to our inspection. The discourse that I have been tracing makes clear that the humoral constitution of race subjects must be cultivated and maintained. But equally clear is the fact that the superior qualities of noble subjects are understood as a set of inherited, if unstable, traits. The instabilities of the humoral model do not undermine the political force of the narratives. This early encoding of race and subjects might also inform later incarnations of racial logic. This is not to offer an evolutionary theory, but only to recognize that discourses get repackaged and redeployed with shifting political agendas. But each time we examine such strategies of naturalization, we better understand the strategies themselves. How these polemics serve particular interests political, economic, social. Such intellectual histories often lack the subjects for whom these ideological discourses are produced. Carey's Tragedy of Marion situates an actor within the discursive field of race at this early modern moment and shows how it colors her imagination. That's it. Thanks very much. Now, I'm not going to try to chair a seminar or uh, choreograph a discussion amongst us. What I can do is offer everyone uh, a top up of wine whilst we embark on a conversation. I have you, one. A conversation with you <laughs> on uh, the, uh, the subject matter of your paper. So I invite someone to start the conversation while I go and rescue the wine bottle. Please do tell me whatever is not clear, whatever is not persuasive, yada, 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 because this um, collection is actually about the intersection of feminism and race. So it better be clear in a thousand words or less. Can I ask how you actually started with the tragedy of Marianne? Why not something else? Because I actually thought this play most provocatively um, made use not only of a, a particular, you know, I mean, it's sort of, it, it is startling in Marion, as Kim Hall says, the extent to which black and white, the binary of black and white, obviously serves a moral encoding of the subjects of the play. Um, Graphena is, is a base form. Um, servant, um, who's nonetheless blindingly white, but she's morally approved in the play. Constabris is a man, along with Herod and Salome, but he is not black. Uh, I mean, you know, this this really does. It, it's marked um, as a, it, it's a field of where subjects are color coded according to their moral disposition in the play. And so, in, my book is interested precisely in moral constitution, whether or not um, morality and eventually through sort of a long um, shifting of discourses and the way they sort of do get repackaged and redeployed, whether religion um, is marked. Um, or understood, apprehended and understood as a, a, an essential reality, a, a feature of human disposition in the body. 
And so here, I think that disposition is most clearly evident in sort of the prejudices, if you will, that she brings to the play, which is that social superiors are moral superiors. And the, the, the evidence is in how she marks her characters. Um, I also think it's important because this play is usually understood because of this, you know, just very evident binary of white and black. It's often, it seems to me, imported into a more modern assessment of race um, that reads an exterior cue as a set of inward characteristics. This is this goes deeper than skin deep, and that's what I'm trying to show is what are the physical technologies, what are the internal workings that are understood to produce morality, so, you know, superior morality, and how does this attach to rank, how does this attach to religion, how does this get used. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a medical theory that's available um, that, that I think usefully explains what's going on in the play, whereas the exterior markings as people sort of have really, through long sort of unpacking, have discovered they don't have a medical theory that underwrites them. This does. And it seems to me we've been overlooking how these things might be understood at this moment, this early modern moment. And you know, then from there, well outside my purview, but we can take we can, we can then move from there to discover, well, okay, is this medical theory getting applied at later times? Because the humors prove remarkably durable. Um, it's just not my area of expertise, so I'd be at <laughs> Okay, so wait, so you just said that people have sort of realized that there's no medical theory underlying uh, skin color? In the right. Theory? Oh, okay. No. There, I mean, they, they, there's not. I mean, okay. they, they, we are there are theories about, there, there are widely variant theories. Well, maybe it's the sun, maybe it's okay. this, maybe it's that. As late as, um, you know, sort of the early Americas, they're still saying it might come from this or it might come from that. There, there, there are question marks all over that field. And so they're, they're generally when you read Irangar or you read um, Mary Floyd Wilson or you read Matthew Demock or you read, you know, um, really, really good scholars in the field, at best they can provide provisional explanations of how race might be, you know, they, they, breaks down almost to a Christian typology. Kim Hall's Things of Darkness is actually a case in point. Brilliant thesis of how that, that those semiotics get applied to ground that you want to mark as other. But it can only play out as a semiotic field in her analysis because it doesn't have a medical theory that underwrites it. The only medical theory that underwrites Hugh is humoral disposition. And it isn't regularly applied to blacks, for example. Um, you know, there's no consistent application of that to Moors, to Turks, to, you know, it, it, it's not there. And so what you have instead is, is largely a disposition that understands blackness as Christian semiotics, black, bad, white, good. And I'm saying, actually, it's, it, it goes beneath the skin. And what produces black is understood as a humoral disposition that then produces black. And it comes from an earlier racial logic that attaches to rank. You know, again, just another theory. But it's one that at least has reams of medical material that it can play with. <laughs> and that makes it come from. I was very interested in, in, in the sense of the focus on colour because um, looking at the Latin American context and um, this sort of encounter with different peoples there, uh, there's actually relatively little reference to colour. But what they say is that they are all different because they're in a different climate, they're under different stars and they eat different foods. 
and that's the reason you know why they are of mm. a certain complexion and less stable and, and not suitable to be wet nurses, for example. Uh, but the colour doesn't seem to so come into it. So yeah. it's, it's quite an interesting um, difference, I think. Yeah, and I think that where it is interesting lies precisely with the the author. Um, you know, I think I, it's the way her imagination is stimulated by, you know, an available medical theory. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that the medical theory that underwrites rank sort of consistently and, you know, in any kind of heavy-handed way emphasizes the color of subjects. But it does talk about it. It does talk about, you know, the way, you know, mm -hmm. um, humoral disease can be detected in the skin. Um, and you know that that certain complexions are an index of an interior disposition, right? Um, but for the most part, I mean, it, this is still a huge battle in Hispanic studies, and, and actually, it's it's quite an interesting battle right now because there are lots and lots of um, theories right now. One of them is is is. Um, argued or put forward by a colleague of mine, Ralph Bauer, that sort of early American and early South American um, understandings, apprehensions of or rationalizations of bodily difference or, or apprehended something like botany, you know, that plants grow differently in this area here. Um, but I think I, I'm not looking either for a straight shot through race or any kind of evolutionary pattern at all. I don't even think that's interesting. What I do think is interesting is when you have social structures that are naturalized through these fantasies of the body, when you look at that, you start to see it, it's, a, it's an invitation, it's a provocation to comparison. And when it does that, it can be pretty illuminating. Well, okay, how did this strategy work here in this island over here? Well, then how does it get applied to the other island over here? And I think in, in every instance, I, I, I often think I'm dissatisfied with these sorts of linear um, notions of race or even notions of race that have stability. It seems to me it falls victim to the very fantasy itself that race is stable. You know, that's part of the discourse, isn't it? You know, that calcifies these differences among peoples as natural, real, and unmovable things. It's, it's not. It's completely malleable, totally shifting, and even now, I think you need to look at different contexts to see how it, it how not only how it evolved, but how it's continuing to develop. And so I'm sort of trying to do that here. This is not a harmless discourse, by the way. I mean, they're not just the noble and common, <laughs> all the problems that came up through there, but, but you know, sort of what I'm trying to trace through Carrie is how this idea of inherited blood um, can in any way trace a discursive path to later uh, tracks, not much later, in fact, only about 40 years later, that affirm that the irreligion or the atheism of Catholics is an inherited trait. Um, were that harmless, it wouldn't have meant that the higher instance of servants, slaves, and they were considered slaves, in the West Indies was Irish Catholic. Um, the proportions of Irish Catholics and English West Indies is just shocking. Um, and it, it's up through the 17th century, and largely what justifies it is this idea that they're not Christians, so you can't enslave them. Is there any sort of notion, I mean, again, talking about that in Iraq, and they talk about purity of blood, right? Mm -hmm. and the, the purity is, a, is, again, a national yeah. thing, you know, it's, a, it's sort of, so you have not tainted by Jewish blood or Moorish blood. That has a slight color yes. side to it. In, but in the English discourse, I mean, is there, is there, is there talk about purity of blood at all? No, I mean, that's, that's actually what I'm, I'm sort of suggesting. They drink from the same trough. Mm -hmm. um, they have different political arrangements. So that, for example, um, part of what prompts 
the purity blood statutes and ideas about purity of blood has to do with the mass conversions of Moors and Jews. In fact, their very passing in society is what renders their status problematic. Were they visibly and easily separated, or you know, were they not Christian, then you know, either rationalization of difference would serve. Um, but where they get truly hysterical is when <laughs> they're becoming incorporate um, and, and when they're um, being sort of weaved in and out of social positions. 1433 is, is at least according to David Nero, the earliest instance in Barcelona, Maria de Barcelona, uh, issued a proclamation that you couldn't um, bar a converso or a morisco from um, public office. But that a royal proclamation is required seems to indicate that this practice has been going on. Um, and that's well before their exit. Um, but you see sort of early these instances of trying to prevent this from happening and then just the, the, the the, the sort of toxic brew of not being able to tell who's different, not being able to mark them as different, becomes too much and they just get, you know, expelled. They must all go. Um, England doesn't afford that kind of easy separation because every Englishman, depending on how many generations you go back, is Catholic. Um, but, what it does, then they do have the same humoral theory upon which Spanish, Spanish expulsion is based. And it is based on these notions of even if you convert, you're not really Christian. Even if you convert, something in your blood, something in your humoral disposition marks you as forever and impressed as other than Christian. Um, and those assumptions, it seems to me, do exert themselves just at a later time. Sorry, I can talk with Blue Street on this stuff. <laughs> Every question is a provocation to an essay. So, <laughs> so you, one of the things that your paper does is sort of, um, you know, respond to Callahan, who's a whose paper I have not read in like 50 years, mm -hmm. uh, by saying, no, it's not nation, it's this sort of uh, inter-family, sort of internal exposition. So anyway, could you just talk a little bit more about what you think she means when she says nation? Like, could you just explain that a little bit more? Who means? Callahan. You say she posits that the struggle Oh, and just, right? and, like, yeah, I'm not taking shots at dinner. Oh, no, no, um, no you're saying but, your argument. But, it's not yeah, just Dimna. I mean, yeah. Dimna is sort of the, the paradigm, but Dimna is Kim Hall, Margaret Ferguson, Tanya Lumba. And what do they understand by that term? They're understanding, and, and it, as the examples that I've chosen for Mario show, it sounds an awful lot like she's making a distinction between Adamites and Jews, between okay. two nations that these are tribal differences, that what's racialized is you are Adamite and therefore base and ugly and, and black. Um, okay, okay. And, and really what I'm saying is when you look at it from rank, Adamite, what, what marks the Adamites as common, mm -hmm. um, Constabulous, for example, is of a high rank among the Adamites, um, among the Adamites. Um, but even in Josephus, this is a constant issue, constant. Even with the Romans, where when Herod um, drowns Aristobulus, he's called before Antony because he is uncomfortable that he has treated a member of the royal family in this way. So that, that it's not just shifting politics, it's that the Idumeans can't be noble because they don't descend from ancient Jews. And that's the issue. Um, nobility everywhere <laughs> seems to be based on duration. You know, how long have you been there? How long has your family been noble? You know, if you're, if you're Hugh Dispenser and recently made noble, that doesn't really 
And that's going off a lot of the early Japanese period, right? Yeah. It doesn't really count. I mean, you can yeah. see it in her history of Edward II. Well, yes, they're noble, but only since last year. Right. <laughs> so it's it's just not. And so what's interesting to me, and I can't, I wasn't able to put it in, is the extent to which Salome adopts this language. She calls Constabras of low estate. Um, I mean, it's fantastic. <laughs> He's of higher estate than she is, if, if you were to go according to in a man hierarchy. Mm -hmm. But he's in a man. And what she's asserting is, this is the new political order, and in it, I'm on top. But it's, it's kind of lovely, because right at that moment, not only is she adopting sort of the racial logic that Marion's been hammering her with, but she also sort of gives the big reveal of, it's whoever is politically on top that gets to make, you know, that, that this is a fundamentally a political arrangement that then gets naturalized through this fantasy of blood. And so to watch Salome try and put it to use is, is a fantastic moment in the play for me. Perhaps uh, if I might just uh, say something about the people on this side of the, the table, what we may have lacked in quantity, I think, but thank you very much indeed for, for the quality of discourse that we, that we have just had. That's absolutely great. Um, interestingly, you know, I, I was asked, I was asked, I was asked, I was yes, I have quoted the map, but very, very different part where he's talking about uh, how to uh, manage uh, a house and how to manage a land and estate. Um, and I think um, also you are a college part. What? Well, uh, I am yeah, indeed, yeah. yes. Well, maybe you uh, and me and Linda probably may well share something in the, in the one of the deans of your, it's probably not your college, it's the college, I think it's dean of College of Behavioral Social Sciences, was a contemporary mm -hmm. student. Wow. Linda and myself and I talked about that. Different field. Different field. Different field. But yes. yeah, but, uh, yeah. So we wish you all the best when you go back to uh, our college part. I hope that uh, you've now have been able to benefit from the time here to get some solid uh, reading and writing done. And Very much. if uh, the final published book bears any resemblance to yeah, the little bit that you've shown us, it's going to be a fascinating read. Thank Thanks, Kim. Sorry about the small numbers of people, but uh, uh, thank you for the time you put into it. Thank you for coming, or I would have been reading. Yeah. Well, that's what we're going to start. Here! <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah, and you, you've had to prepare the paper. I'm sure the paper is, is, is now in form, which is going to be able to slot into the reflective work that's going to go into the nature of the book. So thanks again, and uh, safe journey back.